I think I have, you know, uh, I'm not sure if it's Asperger's or on the autism spectrum. I'm a low level. I'm a highly functioning with a little bit, a little autism. I am very good at repetitive tasks. I talked to myself, told stories, loved sports. And I always felt, even when I got to college, I was ahead of my age group. An inning a night, just one inning. I had to sell during the day, so I got my inning a night. One of the investors in a local TV station was a season ticket holder, and it heard me. <laughs> and he told uh, the owner of the station, the primary owner, you, know, you should give this kid a shot, he's kind of interesting. And uh, they gave me weekend sports, inning of baseball, and then you're off and rolling. And then you're just getting reps and getting better and getting better. And so I don't think it was until I was 32 or 33, I'm now in my 50s, that I really felt like this is who I am. I'm comfortable with these opinions. I'm comfortable with this person. And I think the more me I've been, the more success I've had. And I think it's harder to be that way. I think social media has amplified the fear. We, we live in a tiptoe society. Comics are tiptoeing around jokes. Uh, actors now are tiptoeing around roles. Um, I mean, the, the, the Oscars won't have a host. Um, comedians don't want to perform on college campuses. They'll offend people. And I think it's hard to be authentic and real when everybody's petrified to have a sentence that comes out wrong or a word uh, that people misidentify or just don't like the way it falls. My feeling on this entire business, be who you are, and then the audience will decide if they like who you are. And it may not work, but you'll never really hit in this business if you're not you. Welcome to our 89th episode of American Real, where we continue on location in Los Angeles and take you on the inside of the Fox Sports Complex and bring you an up-close and personal conversation with Colin Cowherd, host of The Herd on Fox Sports Radio and Fox Sports One. We provide a rare look into The Herd's upbringing and take you on his life journey, rising through the ranks as a sports commentator to where he is today at the pinnacle of his career as perhaps the best opinionist in the business with his top-rated show. Colin is in true form, giving his opinion about the current tiptoe society we live in, why it's important to be authentic, and even walks us through his typical day. Truly comfortable in his own skin, the herd reveals he has autism, discusses his secret in being a storyteller, and provides his take on the departure of Bob Costas from NBC. Now, today's episode with Colin Cowherd is brought to you by Audible.com, who is offering a free download of Colin's book, You Heard Me, along with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. Visit audibletrial.com forward slash the herd to claim your free offer and where you can access 180,000 additional titles directly from your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. And now... Without further ado, I bring to you the herd himself, Mr. Colin Cowherd. This is American Real. I am Roger Brooks. My guest today is the herd, Colin Cowherd. You are the host of The Herd with Colin Cowherd a sports talk radio show on Fox Sports and Fox Sports One, mm -hmm. featuring commentary and perspective on the day's sports news, 
In addition, you conduct interviews with celebrities, sports analysts, and sports figures alike. Colin, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate this. You bet. Look, I've been listening to you for a long time. Mm -hmm. And it's so, you know, we we're, were actually talking earlier on our way down here that I really want to tell people stories. Right. We want to know about the Colin behind the mic every day. Sure. And I think it would be great just to talk uh, today about some of those things and, and how you got to where you are today. We're connected by a mutual friend, Glenn Allenack. And yeah. You guys go way back to Vegas, is that right? Yeah, we'll go way back to Vegas. He ran a, uh, own, was a co-owner of an Italian restaurant. And uh, I would do the nightly news and I had my mornings off and I met him at a, uh, I think it was like a gym or a workout club. And so uh, we just started hanging out and I would go on deliveries, delivering pasta to casinos in town because he made pasta, not only for his restaurant, but for restaurants around town. And I uh, struck up a friendship and uh, just an interesting, funny guy from, you know, kind of that Binghamton, That's Ithaca right. area in upstate New York. Yes. Yeah. So Andy sends his regards, of course, uh, to you. And um, I also had the chance to interview another friend of yours, Trace Gallagher. Yes, he's a political uh, reporter for Fox News. Funny story, I, I was a uh, sports broadcaster, my first job out of college in Vegas, and we hired him. He had been a professional water skier, and we hired him. He had one sports coat, one tie, a remarkable ability to talk without a script, mm. and uh, he's one of the best live reporters I've ever seen. And he's had a great career. He, he bounced around the country. It's funny, we've kind of followed each other. We met in Vegas. We worked together. Then he got a job in Orlando. I got a job in Tampa. He got a job in San Francisco. I got a job in Portland. He went to Connecticut to work in New York. I went to Connecticut to ESPN. And then we both end up in Manhattan Beach, California. It's been so bizarre. That's so cool. And that was over what, like a 30-year time? Over a 30-year right. time period. In fact, I introduced Trace to his wife, Tracy. And he did tell that story, yeah, by the way. Yeah, no. So he's just, he's been a good friend forever. What I admire about both of you is you're both authentic, you know, and it's, it's, it's hard to find today. And I know you even talk, I've, I've seen clips of you talking about yeah. authenticity. Yeah. And I know that's important. You've said, I don't, you know, I really don't care because I am who I am. How yeah, I, and I think it's harder to be that way. I think social media has amplified the fear. We, we live in a tiptoe society. Comics are tiptoeing around jokes. Uh, actors now are tiptoeing around roles. Um, I mean, the, the, the Oscars won't have a host. Um, comedians don't want to perform on college campuses. They'll offend people. And I think it's hard to be authentic and real when everybody's petrified to have a sentence that comes out wrong or a word uh, that people misidentify or just don't like the way it falls. And so I, I, I don't know if I have a brand. My, my feeling on this entire business, be who you are, and then the audience will decide if they like who you are. And it may not work, but you'll never really hit in this business if you're not you. you know, and I would say when I was in my 20s doing this, I wasn't enough me. I liked Bob Costas or I liked Al Michaels, and I would, I would uh, glean too much of other people as I was creating my own persona. And it's harder than people think, especially in the opinion space, when you want to be this confident, powerful voice. So I don't think it was until I was 32 or 33, I'm now in my 50s, that I really felt like this is who I am, I'm comfortable with these opinions, I'm comfortable with this person, and I think the more me I've been, that I, people can identify who I am, the more success I've had. That's great advice. And I actually heard you talking upstairs just now. Yeah. You were talking about like college kids. Do a good, have a good interview. Give a good interview. Yes. It's okay. You don't have to have that 4.0. You have that 3.5. You work hard. I tell my daughter that all the time. Yeah. I said high school grades matter. But once you get to college, have a life. Yeah. Go on a date. Uh, join a sorority. Have, you know, take internships. She's going to go to um, uh, South America this summer. And we're like, with a bunch of other college students. I'm like, it's an experience. Who cares how many credits it is? So, you know, I, and I tell my daughter that, is that stay off social media. It, it, it's, Twitter's not real life. You know, you go on Twitter, and, you know, everybody is trying to win an argument. Everybody is trying to frame or marginalize somebody else. And I said, just be real. Get along with people. Put the phone down. Make eye contact. Uh, I said, you'll get a job based on, do you interview well? Because what happens in life is you compete against yourself. The garbage man does not 
compete against the surgeon. The surgeon competes against the surgeon for the chief of staff job at Boston General. So when everybody's qualified for a great job, what wins it? You go to dinner, and your wife connects with his wife, and after an hour and a half, on their drive home, she says, I really like him. We could go out with them. Because everybody that applies to be the heart surgeon, it's Cedar sinai they all went to an Ivy League school. Right. They're all qualified. So you compete against yourself in life. You're generally not going to be far more qualified or far less qualified. So you better socially connect. And if you do, that will elevate your opportunities in life. Yeah, no, it's great. And it's, and it's about that connection, right? About the relationship. Yes. Going deeper than just the role or the job. Right. Yeah. Uh, and you touched on something just now about social media. And I do agree. Yeah. But what do you think about if you're putting out good content? No, that's fine. I, I use it. I put out my already edited content. I think social media, uh, last year, uh, pat on back, we had 330 million views on Facebook. Uh, it's a Incredible. remarkable number. We're putting out what we think is our best stuff, and then it's amplified over social media. That's fine. Um, I think as long as, again, use it as a promotional marketing tool. But I'm a sportscaster. I'm not going to go politics. Okay, David Spade announced today. He said, I'm going to do a new late night show. No politics. To me, nothing against Jimmy Kimmel, Stephen Colbert. They're all the same show now. It's anti-Trump. I'm not a Trump guy. But I'm, I don't turn to you for political savagery. Make me laugh. Mm -hmm. Banging on Trump now is a cliche. Everybody can do it. I think the guy who's really great is Colin Quinn, red state, blue state, who probably leans a little left, but is basically mocking both sides. That's why I always like Jon Stewart. I'm not interested in far left and far right. It's too easy to rip Trump. It's, it's, I mean, for a comedian, it's a layup. Shoot some threes. <laughs> Go find stuff that's hard to make jokes about. That's why I appreciate uh, you know, the Colin Quinns uh, or Sebastian. the Ricky Gervais, people that make me laugh about stuff I don't normally laugh about. Trump's become a layup. So again, I think social media is fine, but everybody now is using it for the same thing, which is let's attack this, let's attack that, let's be PC here. And it's numbing. It, I'm bored with it. And speaking of Trump, I, I actually, you know, when I was doing my research, you nailed it. You, you, first of all, you had a call with Trump before the election. Yeah. How did, what was that called? Like? Well, he was a real estate guy. He was a reality show guy. I didn't right. take it seriously. Okay. I mean, he was running for president. Everybody run for president. Right. I mean, there's like, in the last month, I've heard nine people. I didn't think he had any chance in the world. And then, probably two, one or two months after that, I'm like, you know what? There's a, he's, he's galvanizing his base. I think he's going to be competitive. Um, but yeah, I mean, the interview, I, I didn't think he was a viable candidate. At that time. At that time. But then the next day after the election, you came back on and you said, I, look, I just have to talk about it. I did. Do you remember what you said? Yeah, I said, our republic is built for a, to withstand a bad president. What I never, Jimmy I Carter? Did, yeah, Jimmy Carter was not a great president. I didn't think Trump would be a great president. I don't think he's intellectually curious enough. A little bit of a bully, not my, not my cup of tea. But, but our republic is built to withstand that. What our republic is not built to withstand is a media they don't trust. And going into the election and coming out of it, I felt I had lost trust with the media, that it was too agenda-driven. Again, I'm not a Trump fan. It's, he's not my cup of tea. I didn't vote for him. I wouldn't. But I think there has been, Jerry Seinfeld said this about a month ago. The media was talking about Trump, and Jerry said, maybe the media should do a better job. That's exactly how I feel. Now, I, I think the media has failed me. I... I now am not interested, uh, and I, you know, I'm in the media, so I've backed it my entire life. I feel the media has lost a sense of even remote fairness. Like, you can't tell me over two years, nothing, no policy has been successful. So I, I think it's been a, uh, a failure of our media for two years. By the way, stop using the word bombshell on Russia either deliver it 
or stop using it. If I was the editor of a newspaper, I would not allow that word up anymore. But you can't keep promise me in bombshell <laughs> and not deliver on it. Let's talk a little bit more about you and, and how do you come up with all this content? So you must be reading constantly. Yes. Um, I think I had a unique childhood experience. Um, my sister was five years older, so she was out of junior high by the time I entered it, out of high school by the time I entered it. She had a different social circle. I mean, what what 13-year-old girl wants to hang out with her seven, eight-year-old brother? Five-year gap. And so um, we're much closer now than we were as kids. And so I was alone a lot. Not lonely, there's a difference. I was alone a lot, playing wiffle ball by myself, filling out lineup cards to be the Dodgers or the Cincinnati right. Reds. Um, I was alone a lot, playing basketball, rurally, not in a subdivision. So I, t I played basketball often with myself and baseball with myself and announced the game. Mm. And so I, I talked through. So by the time I got to college, I was a fairly polished 18-year-old kid. Like, you could put me in front of a mic and I could just talk into a game. And I think I had a very unique childhood experience. Rural, not a lot of kids around. Love sports. Love sports. Had a sibling that was older to me, so I was kind of doing my own thing. And I talked to myself, told stories, loved sports. And I always felt, even when I got to college, I was ahead of my age group. I was already a, in my mind, I was already a play-by-play -play guy. I had done a million thousand, I'd done 10 million words of, what's the Malcolm Gladwell, the 10,000 hour oh, rule? that's right. I'd done 100,000 hours of play-by-play, -play and I was 17. Yeah. And I felt that to the, you know, I didn't at the time know what, who Malcolm Gladwell was, but there's that 10,000 hour rule. Sure. I think I blew past it by the time I was 13. And there's a science to that. Yeah. So you come out of school, you end up in Vegas. Was that your first market? Yeah. And you do what? Double A. I do a little. Uh, I do some triple uh, A baseball. Triple A. An inning a night. An inning a night. An inning a night. Just, just one run. inning. Wow. That's all they gave me. I had to sell during the day, so I got my inning a night, and then a one of the investors in a local TV station was a season ticket holder, and it heard me, <laughs> and he told. Uh, the owner of the station, the primary owner, you know, you should give this kid a shot. He's kind of interesting. His name was Hank Tester. Okay. And the owner was Jim Rogers, who has since passed, the, the, the liberal lion of Las Vegas. And uh, they gave me weekend sports, inning of baseball, and then you're off and rolling. And then you're just getting reps and getting better and getting better. And, and uh, I, I didn't have any TV experience at the time, so I wasn't very good, but I was uh, aggressive to a fault, uh, developing my style, and just over time you just start, it's masonry. You put a brick on a brick on a sure. brick on a brick, and I was always willing to move for commerce. You know, a lot of people get a job in Vegas and they, they live there, and they get a job in Des Moines, Iowa, and they live there. You and to me, I was, I was always pretty aspirational, and I'm like, nope, I'm not going to get caught up in having a nice car. I'll drive a beater. I want to be able to be nimble and move to the next job. So I, I, I was always, you know, steadfast in my belief that where I was currently at was not the final destination. What was your end game at that time? What did you want to do at that point? That's a good question. Um, I thought if I could be a local sportscaster and then be a baseball announcer. So let's say I was in Seattle and I was the number two voice of the Mariners and then I did the 10 o'clock news. I'd do both. That would have been ideal. That'd been ideal. I could be a baseball announcer, maybe not the lead guy. I can be the number two guy, and then I take off in the sixth inning as the lead guy wraps up, and I go to the local NBC affiliate, and I do the nightly news. And I always thought that was a cool way to play it. Now, take us through your journey. So that didn't happen. You had some nice breaks, but you, like you said, you went after it. Yeah, you, then you, I was in Vegas for a while. Then, uh, then after about six, seven years, I was like, you know what? Um, it's just time to grow. I wasn't learning anything new. Then I went to Tampa for two years. Management wasn't great at the station. Learned a lot. Didn't love the humidity and kind of the Florida vibe. And I'm like, okay, 
And then uh, Portland, Oregon offered me a job. I could go back home. And I'm like, yeah, 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 I'll be close enough to Seattle. And then I thought I may stay there. And then ESPN came knocking. And I did that for 10 years. But I, I would say about year seven of the 11 I was there, you know, I was like, I don't know. I'm not sure if this is the, it was a factory. I'm not really a factory guy. Like it was just a big giant factory. I, I liked it. But the longer I was there, I met my wife, the less inclined I was to stay there. And then about a year, 12 months before I left, my wife and I had made a decision to roll the dice and do other stuff. We were just bored. Uh, the weather was really cold in the winter. Um, I was from the West Coast. She liked the West Coast. And so we were just looking for opportunities, and Fox came knocking. Let's talk a little bit about Portland, because I lived there for five years. Yeah. What, what's your impression of Rip City? Well, um, I always said it, it, if it was a baseball market, it's the world's best AAA market, is that it's not a big city. They have an NBA franchise and yet have never hosted an all-star game because they don't have the hotel room. It's a great, the best AAA city in America. Uh, it knows it's not New York. It knows it's not LA, Chicago, Dallas, Atlanta. Uh, it's, it's kind of a wet Austin, Texas. It's um, unique sees the world differently, uh, embraces its quirkiness uh, and its political activism. And so it was a fun place to live. You know, it's a really, it really has its own vibe. It feels different than even Seattle, neighboring Seattle, which feels much more techy, big city. That feels like a wet LA. Whereas Portland feels like Austin, Texas. Just kind of, we're gonna put our arms around being a little weird and a little different. And I happened to be there 1991, 92 years of the Dream Team. And I actually worked for Clyde Drexler at the time, uh, helping out with his t-shirt line. And it was so wonderful because I was 21, uh, 20, 21. And I got the chance to hang out with him and a lot of the Dream Team members. Yeah. So for a kid, and I was listening to a lot of sports radio back then. Yeah. And it was just a, a great time to be in Portland and, and just, you know, a great place to be. Yeah, and they really love their Blazers. You know, the advantage to being in a San Antonio or a Portland or a Green Bay is that one team means so much to kind of the tapestry of the city. Like, it's really, they really deeply care. You don't have, LA's got eight teams, you know, 12 yep. teams. 31 concert venues. It's a, it's, an, it's a very distracted market. San Antonio, Green Bay, Portland. What matters is that one team. Preparation and mindset. We talked a little bit about all this content and you grew up, you know, the play-by-play. -play. So you kind of, you have a, obviously have a great knack for what you do. But can you give us just a little insight as to what's an average day like for you? What, what, are, you, what are you doing on a daily basis? Get up at 5.30, out the door by 5, well, I'd say get up at 5.20, out the door by 5.40, 20-minute drive to work, show up here, uh, get a coffee, go down to the, our meeting room where there's about 12 people. We have a writer, several producers, graphics people, and we spitball ideas. And this is what matters. We pick about five stories, maybe six, that matter. And um, FS1 plays to my strengths. I'm an opinion guy. I've done play-by-play. -play, I've reported. I've worked for a, a part-time for a newspaper. Um, I've done hosting. I've done local anchoring. I'm an opinionist. That's what I do. And FS1 is built for opinionists. That's what we do. We don't, we're not muddied here. There's total clarity in what we do. It reminds me, you know, CNN years ago was covering the world, and then Fox News came in and said, no, we're going to talk America, domestic issues, and a lot of politics. And by the way, we're going to lean right on this stuff. Nobody else is doing that. At FS1, we came out and said, listen, we're going to do opinions, and we're going to talk about 70% NFL. And it's working, and we're growing, and nobody in linear TV is, and <laughs> right. we are. Yeah. Um, I, in fact, in, in January, I've grown three straight years. January, I was up 35%. That's not, that, those stories aren't happening. Uh, undisputed, similarly growing. Uh, speak for yourself, first things first. We have a very clear picture of what we do. And I would say this. Let's say you and I move to England, and we're going to start a sports network. And it's, it's a crowded 
You have Sky Sports. You have all these different uh, options. If I said to you, all right, Roger, here's what we're going to do. We're going to get fairly well-known sports opinionists, and we're going to talk about the English Premier League 75% of the time. Journalism? Well, journalism, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Opinions? Every show. What about cricket? Not really. What about Wimbledon? Briefly. <laughs> we're going to talk about the English Premier League. Yeah. That's what we do. Yeah, because well, people want that. We're not, we're not designed to do everything for everybody. We are going to give you strong opinions on the NBA, the NFL, some college football, October baseball, and maybe a big Conor McGregor fight. That's what we do. And that's built for my DNA. Strong opinions on stuff that matters. Let somebody else cover tennis. I play tennis. After this, after this interview, I'm having a tennis lesson. I love tennis. I'm not going to make my show. And really, is that because you want to give what the, what the viewers craving. I am, Jay Leno said this, I saw Judd Apatow did a special on Gary, Sh Gary Shanley. And I've watched it a couple times. Jay Leno said something that I totally related to. I'm not Jay Leno, not that talented, but he said something. He said, Shanling struggled because he didn't like repeating himself. Gary Shanling's ideology was, you've got to top yourself. And Leno said, I'm the opposite. I'm very good at repeating simple tasks, telling jokes. That's how it works for me. I think I have, you know, uh, I'm not sure if it's Asperger's or on the autism spectrum. I'm a low level. I'm a highly functioning uh, with a little bit, I think, a, a little autism. I am very good at repetitive tasks. Very good at that. Uh, a mile deep on stuff. I don't need to every day top myself. I eat the same thing for breakfast the same thing for lunch, one of four things for dinner. I live a life of patterns. That makes me happy. That's how my brain operates. I'm not an artist. I like to surround, my wife is. I surround myself with people uh, that are more adaptable and that fill in the blanks for me on my staff and in my life. But like Leno said, I'm very good at that. So if you said NFL, 70%, never been happier. NBA, 20%, you got it. In fact, in the NBA, just talk about six stars. That works for my brain. That's and so that's cool. why FS1's a perfect fit. So as a kid, stats, very important to you? I mean, could you memorize no, things? No, I like or? stories. Hmm. I'm more of a story guy. Okay. You can always suck me into a story. Now, I, do, I use data to put an exclamation point on my stories. I think data matters. I want to give people proof, validation, verification of what I'm saying. But stories suck me in. I tend to think... Radio is storytelling, books are smart, Twitter's clever, and TV's about being dynamic. Mm -hmm. Generally, if you look at the history of TV shows that have worked, from Sopranos to Mary Tyler Moore, um, there's something dynamic. The characters, the writing, the plot, um, um, the story, something. In television, there's a million channels. What catches my eye? Simon Cowell, Gordon Ramsay. Right. Big, explosive, dynamic, NBA, NFL. You know, baseball on TV is a slower pour. It doesn't have the pace. It's not dynamic. So baseball works on radio, which is storytelling, but it doesn't work on television as well because it's not dynamic. And so I'm doing a show that is simulcast. So on radio, I'm doing storytelling. But if you watch me on television, I use my hands, I fluctuate my voice, and I want to be more dynamic. So that's just the, that's just the ideology of each medium. And do you feel that you are now totally in your element? Yes. And do you feel everything you've done to, na to this day, you've been preparing for now? I don't think I was actively doing that. I think I have coincidentally done that, and it's landed right. I'm not like a gymnast that jumped off the beam knowing how he was going to land. I landed well, but I didn't have a plan. I, my plan was reps, experience, read a lot, go, and I've jumped off the beam, and I landed right. But I, don't, I didn't have some uh, you know, choreographed plan 28 years ago to be doing this. In fact, 
this didn't exist. There wasn't a sports network right. like FS1 that said strong opinions on about four things. That, it's built it for me, anything, right. but it wasn't available. And timing is everything. Everything. Yeah. Uh, you talked about story. I love that. Um, our, our tagline is everyone has a story. How important is it for people to find their voice? We talked about authenticity, but then taking it the step further. Find your voice and being comfortable in your own skin, taking off that mask. I think it's everything. No matter what you do in life. Yeah, and, and that's why you can be really talented as a 27-year-old male-female broadcaster. I'm not disputing your uh, prep school. You can go to a, a Connecticut prep school. You can go to Syracuse. You can get a master's at Missouri. You can go to, but you're a 27-year-old. You don't know who you are yet. I mean, Bob Costas at 26 wasn't Bob Costas at 46. So rarely do I turn on a 27-year-old and am I as captivated as I am with a 47-year-old? I'll give you an example. In the opinion space, let's talk about the top 30 opinionists in the country, regardless of political spectrum or sports. Skip Bayless, uh, Stephen A. Smith, Rachel Maddow, Sean Hannity, Rush Limbaugh. I could name all of them. All of the top, you know, Bill Maher, uh, at one point John Stewart, None of them are in their 20s. I don't believe any of them are in their 30s. Because of, you need that life experience. You need the gravitas. You need the life experience. If you're going to tell me or lecture me on life, Bill Maher is now 50. He's lived a lot of it. So you have to be very careful when you're building, a, and I think our network's done a really good job. If you look up and down our network, Nick Wright is, is the kid. You know, he's right. in his mid to late 30s. But I think he is. Um, but it's mostly 40-year-olds. Or Tucker. Shannon Tuck, Sharp, yeah. Chris Carter, yep. Skip, yep. me, Whitlock, Marcellus Wiley, married, kids, lives. So I think in the opinion space, gray hair is a wonderful thing. <laughs> I love that. You like to talk about family and sports. Yeah. You know, the Edelmans, the Steph Currys, how important that is, the, the guys that are drafted. Why is that? Well, it's funny. Uh, you know, my sister and I joke about this. On the outside, you would think I had a very dysfunctional family. Uh, my dad was married five times, but I only lived with him in the house with my mother. Uh, okay. She had three by the time she had passed. Now, again, you know, one was 20 years, one was you know, 15. They were longer. But I tell my sister all the time is it really wasn't confounding. It really wasn't, I didn't feel it was some disparate life where there was avenues, choices, options, strangeness. I lived in the same house. I had the same friends. I rode dirt bikes in the summer, played basketball in the yard. Despite all this uh, perceived chaos, I lived a very normal life. Mm. I went to an in-state university. I still, I had, you know, it was very structured. And so when I look at sports, you can have all these stars and you can be mobile, but there's a core and an essence to every great sports team. The Warriors are not about mobility. They drafted Curry, they drafted Clay, they drafted Draymond. Now Durant is certainly the icing on the cake, but they won a title without him. They set the 73 win regular season record without him. He's restless. He's never felt like family to me. He's just talent. Jeter felt like Yankee family. A-Rod felt like talent. The big difference. I get you. Yep. Yeah. Patriots. Brady and Edelman and Gronk feel like family. Randy Moss was a cousin that dropped by <laughs> right. for a couple years. I think if you look at great teams, Magic and Kareem were Lakers. You yeah. can move the rest of it around. Great teams are rarely thrown together. Even Miami with the Heat. Okay. Did you really just expect two championships? No, really. I don't think so. It never worked perfectly. There was some disharmony because it felt like outside of D, D Wade and Udonis Haslam, it, was just... it felt like visitors. San Antonio, that final mm. year, blew them out. Those guys felt like family. So you can have, you know, the principles and values of family never change. You need, when you, when you drive down the road and you see a new house being built, it starts with a foundation. Now, you, you can bring in a roof and cool doors and have these perfectly insulated windows. You can do a lot of... There's a lot of sizzle out there, but the stake's the foundation. And if you look at the great teams in pro sports history, the Steelers in the 70s, 
the Bill Walsh Niners. There's always a foundational core of players and coaches. Cowboys. I mean, the, the Patriots. Belichick, Dante Skarnecki, the O-line coach, Josh McDaniel and a running back coach. you got four coaches that have been there 95% of the snaps. That's why they keep winning. It's huge. Yeah. What advice do you have for those up-and-comers, the youngsters who really love a career yeah. like yours yeah. or, you know, starting out as, as an a analyst or um, play-by-play? It's competitive today. Yes. Trace and I were talking about this because the smaller markets are kind of going away. Disappeared. Yeah. Listen and read. You don't have the answers at 20. Don't go on Twitter and argue with people. Watch, observe. I don't need to hear your every thought. I think about things all the time. I don't say them. I don't talk about them. Talk less, listen more. Be a great observer. I always thought one of the, the gifts of Obama over Clinton um, that he listened better. Bill's a great orator, but would fall in love with his own cadence and voice. Obama was more word efficient. He was a great listener. That's the separation from the two. They were both great talkers. I always thought Obama was a better listener. And, and I tend to believe young people want their voice to be heard, and I get that, and I am going to look at you and judge you, but don't put too much out there. You don't have enough life experience. Work, you know, if you're a young NBA reporter, you don't need to be on Twitter all day. Fewer tweets, the better. Make your tweets matter. Listen, be formidable. Don't just splatter stuff, because then my first impression of you is, who's that? Yeah. Edit. Edit your conversations. Edit your life. Uh, don't spill as much paint. Everybody's in a rush to be heard. But the truth is, you're much better to be heard at 40 than 20. You have more information. So I would tell young people, listen, read everything, you don't, I don't need to hear your opinion on everything. There are days, sign off, read. Sign off, listen. Um, I think society is pushing young people, express yourself, show yourself. The problem is, you're very, you can be really unrefined. I don't like what I'm seeing or hearing, and I go to my bosses and say, don't hire them. They can't control themselves. They, this person doesn't work with a brand. I mean, I've, I've had multiple times in the last, I would say, six or seven years as the amplification of social media has increased, where I've literally been asked about hiring somebody and I've said, no, nah, I don't trust them on social media. They're unhinged. Isn't that something? It's amazing how I've never hired somebody because they were great on Twitter. Multiple people, I've warned my bosses, don't hire because they're unhinged on No, and it's a good reality of, of what that person's all about. Form a solid opinion and then deliver it. Don't race to just deliver. Form, then deliver. Colin, yeah. what did you think about Bob Costas being let go by NBC and the NFL having something to do with it? Well, from what I gather, Bob Costas wanted to give a commentary on the perils and dangers of the NFL on Super Bowl Sunday. And to that I would say, that's not the time or the place. Game seven of a World Series, Sunday at the Masters, game seven of the Stanley Cup, and the Super Bowl. Those are showcase events. Costas has a right to his opinion as a citizen, and NBC certainly granted him that. But to then trade that for a sports showcase event is tone down. Can you imagine game seven of the World Series, 1991? Steroids are rampant in baseball. The St. Louis Cardinals are facing the Detroit Tigers. Game seven, everybody pins and needles. Was that the time for Bob Costas before the first pitch to say, I'd like to talk about rampant steroid abuse. These records are being shattered. Tonight's outcome, it should be noted, uh, could be swayed by illegal drugs and go on a smartly crafted four minute commentary and then say, all right, let's play ball. The audience doesn't want that. The league doesn't want it, and your network doesn't. And there's always been, Roger, a different relationship between the Washington Post and the White House 
and a network in the NFL. We're in a business relationship. Okay, when I do the herd, I can say whatever I want about anybody, within reason. Mm -hmm. But when I'm on Sunday NFL kickoff, which I am 20 weeks a year, that is not the time or the place for my dissertations. My producer will tell me what he wants me to talk about. Now, Costas has certainly earned the right to an opinion, which NBC granted for years. Town halls, uh, uh, radio, they, they never stopped him. But I don't think you trade that for a showcase event because the audience doesn't want it. And that's the NBA Finals. Mike Breen's the voice of the NBA on ESPN. Would that be the time before Game 7 to say, I'd like to do a smartly crafted an opinion on a tanking problem in the NBA? <laughs> the league doesn't want it. As a consumer, I don't want it. There's a time and a place time and for a place. everything. So I think Costas has had a remarkable <clears throat> career. But I think as a broadcaster, it's important for me to always realize Sometimes it's about me, the herd. My radio show is about a relationship between me, the mic, and my audience. But when I, I'll be part of Fox's Super Bowl broadcast next year, it's not about me. I am a component to the broadcast. And they will tell me what they want me to discuss, and I will be heavily produced. And that's, that's the relationship as a broadcaster. Costas is not a random gonzo blogger. He is an experienced 30-year-plus television veteran. On some of the biggest, grandest stages, he knows the game. He knows that timing is everything. I mean, timing's everything in relationships. You know, there's certain things I can say to my wife at certain times. That's, right. <laughs> that's just the way the world works. In yeah. a job interview, in a relationship, in a, there are certain discussions you can have with a coworker at a bar having a beer and then in cubicles, one will get you fired. One is just a odd conversation at, you know, Senor Froggies or Applebee's. That's right. So I think, I, I thought the story was interesting that Costas found that it was his time and a place for that. Now, journalists will back him, I'm sure. I'm sure journalists think it. But the newspaper business has never been the television business. There's a reason that newspapers have critics that opine on TV. We don't have critics that opine about newspapers. We're TV stars. We're on TV shows. This is entertainment. NFL's entertainment. Even my show, I have to be entertaining. I could just dryly read my opinions. I have to perform. It's sure. theater. Vin Scully. Oh, the best. The best. Great story. He was performing. I don't see that as a negative. Colin, you're a performer. Yeah, part of my 30% of what I do is performing. I'm not being, I'm not invalidated. I'm not lying about what I'm saying. I'm telling you what I think, but I'm moving my hands. I'm my voice, my pitch, my tone. You know, you're, you're, I'm out here on a television network, on a television show. That's part of our business. Why, why would he do it? Well, he's not naive. Um, he's too smart. I, I think it is, uh, I think we all, anybody can be deluded over time, thinking your voice is more important. I think that's just, that is, uh, I think we're all, uh, as a husband, as a dad, sure. yeah. I want to impart wisdom to my kids. Am I helping him or is that my <laughs> ego? I want to I be right in this argument with my, with my wife. Am I really helping our relationship or is it my ego? I think Costas, like any human, has an elevated sense at times of self. That's what it felt like to me, which isn't a shot at him. It's a very human quality. But I don't think Super Bowls, Game 7s, Sunday at the Masters, or the final stage of the Tour de France is time for a criticism of said event. Just not a good judgment call yeah. for that day. Yeah. Well, look, this has been great. I so much appreciate you sharing your story. Um, just two quick questions. First, if you were to take out your cell phone and call the 20-year-old Colin, what would you tell him? That's a great question. Uh, enjoy the journey a little more. Don't be so hyper-focused on your career. Enjoy the journey. Um, um, there's plenty of time. Uh, you're not in a rush. Uh, I came from, uh, you know, my mom and dad got divorced, so I was at least financially felt I was a little on my own, had to make it work. I think there was a little uh, a relentlessness to me that was hard to work with and off-putting. So I tell myself, enjoy the ride. Take a deep breath. Sleep in today. It's okay. Cool. 
And one last question I ask every guest. Ultimately, what do you want your legacy to be? What mark do you want to leave? Um, well, I mean, primarily uh, to be there for my kids, to be there for my wife. I, my, I, my, I don't worry too much about my broadcasting legacy. I think that's mostly vanity. I don't really care. I, I, I mean, I, I hope people would say, he worked his butt off, you could tell, and he was really thought-provoking. And I think I've created that. But in terms of broadcasting legacy, you know, it falls where it falls. You know, I'm in the opinion space. Some like me, some don't. Um, I am terrified of not having the right parental legacy or failing as a husband. That's what keeps me up at night. That's when I don't sleep well. I rarely struggle with sleep because of a topic. I couldn't tell you the last time I struggled because of a topic. But as a dad, a lot of sleepless nights. Um, am I doing the right thing? Am I giving him good advice? Um, am, am I qualified? <laughs> you know, what am I doing as a dad? That stuff keeps me up at night. And that's what I really worry about. And I think most people, um, the, the broadcasting part of it, I'm, I'm happy where I'm at. And I think of the seven, eight, of the seminal voices that matter to me, the bosses, the people in my industry that really matter, they know how hard I work. They know how seriously I take it. They know I'm not just making stuff up. You know, I think I have delivered on that. As a parent, I'm, I'm sandpapering everything I do every day. I'm, I'm trying to modify everything I do. I think I fail a lot as a parent, as a husband. That I can't master. I could totally relate. <laughs> can't we all? <laughs> yes. This has been great. Thank you. Thanks so much for your time. You Thanks for sharing your story. And welcome to the American Real family. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to American Real. Be sure to visit our website, AmericanReal.tv, or search for us on iTunes or YouTube for past episodes. While you're there, please rate us or leave us a review, as that helps others find our show. I am truly grateful and appreciate all of your support. At American Real, we're on a mission to help as many people around the world fulfill their dreams and obtain their goals. If you'd like to be part of our inner circle or want one-on-one -on -one coaching, check out the American Real Learning Academy, where we have self-help groups and courses so you can build the best you. We also have a new Facebook group where you can connect with high achievers from around the world. If you want to go even further, maybe you're determined to write your own book or launch your own podcast, contact me today to see if we could help. You can reach me through Instagram or Facebook or email me directly at roger at americanreal.tv. And speaking of podcasting, our next course will be starting soon. So if you're interested in launching your own podcast, join me and podcast your passion. I'll take you through my eight-week course where I'll mentor you to build a world-class podcast. I'm only taking on a small group of people who want to share their passion through broadcasting, where I'll have you up on iTunes and YouTube within weeks so you can podcast your passion. Click on the link below for more information. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next week.